Good kitten, Internet. This may be a very big kitten. It's still a kitten. Even to my dismay from time to time. Still a kitten. But usually, it's a good thing that he acts like a kitten. Makes me feel better. <sighs> good kitten, Internet. So, I decided today I was going to do a relatively easy vlog. Eh, easy for me. Doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be short or anything. But I'm going to talk about how I make role-playing characters. So, um, one of the things that came up in my last video, I'm just using my tripod so I don't have to hold, and I'm trying to do this all in one take. Um, one of the things that came up in one of the videos that I had posted once upon a time, this is a really high, mm, mm, just that work. So, one of the things that came up in a previous video was um, how I tend to make characters quite frequently. Uh, I don't like this angle. So one of the things that came up in one of my previous videos was that I make role-playing characters on a somewhat regular basis. Um, not just D&D, but any type, and I tend to frequently make different types of characters depending on situations. And one of the things I've been asked in the past, not just by, sorry, I'm moving the tripod a little bit, um, not just by people watching the vlog, but by anybody, there, that'll work. But by anybody was, how do I make them? Um, there's a lot of different styles of making role-playing characters. And I tend to go for two particularly major ones. Uh, what I'm going to call mechanics first and concept first. So, <clears throat> I'll give some examples with my current two PCs, because they were actually made in opposing ways. So, my current one, the one that I'm currently playing for a campaign that's already started, um, she... Why am I having problems remembering her name? That's why I have a tablet here, so I can grab her character sheet. Um... Maybe editor me from the future can put her character sheet right there. Sure, we'll go with that. So, Endiel Corvin, see? I totally have her character sheet on my tablet. Um, Endiel Corvin was made mechanics first. That is, um, Endiel's a 5th edition D&D character. And I made her first off with the idea that I had never played a warlock before. So, I wanted to make a warlock character. That's what I mean by mechanics first. My very first idea when it came to the character is, I am making insert mechanic here. And there's nothing wrong with going this approach. There's nothing wrong with going with most approaches. Let me be clear. Let me also zoom myself in a little bit. Um... It's just that there's multiple conflicting ways of doing it, and I use multiple personally. So, and deal was mechanics first. I come up with the idea of, okay, I want to play a warlock. What sounds like fun that goes along with a warlock? Well, mechanically, I would like to play... Well, let me go look at the different types of warlocks that we have available. Uh, and deal was created at level 4. So, for D&D characters, level 4 is usually... You're not a brand new adventurer, you've at least done something once or twice. I wanted to take that concept and flip it around on its head. And I frequently do that for a lot of things. I usually take a mechanical concept and do it in a very strange way, or I take a non-mechanical concept and make a strange character out of it. It's kind of a hallmark of any of my characters at this point. So, in Deal, I... okay. We've got mechanics. We've got a warlock. 
what else can I do with a warlock? Well, warlocks have super high charisma, but they're stereotypically make a deal with the devil types, so they frequently have um, ways of deceiving people. They are frequently users of deception and maybe performance. Okay, I can work with that, I can work with that. I'm gonna also add, I'm gonna make myself a diplomancer. That's, that's a character concept that I'm fairly comfortable with myself. So it'll work fairly well for a brand new character. Watch out, Zun looks like he's about to hit the tripod. Um, okay, I can do that. That's not, that's fairly plain Jane. Let me go look at the archetypes. So in 5th edition D&D, and also Pathfinder, Pathfinder is a very similar thing, every class has an archetype selection. And the archetype selection happens somewhere between levels 1 through 3. So, early on in the character's career, since we're starting at level 4, that means this has already happened. And I decided I wanted to play a Celestial Warlock. Celestial Warlocks are known for the fact that they actually have some healing abilities, and their made-a-deal-with-the-devil concept is made-a-deal-with-an-angel instead. Which could be a lot of fun turning things around on their head. I... One of my early concepts for Endeal was an evil character who made a deal with an angel. Um, that could actually have taken place. I've mentioned this in previous D&D related video, but Endeal, I have her backstory from a, from like childhood on to a certain point. That certain point is the last bit of her memory. Um, she basically walked into a bar, took a drink, and that's the last thing she remembers. She was not a warlock prior to this. And that's, this is where I started playing around with the concept of, alright, warlocks are typically silver-tongued folk. You know who else is stereotypically silver-tongued? Used car salesman. So, I'm going to make a merchant warlock. Wait. Why would a merchant have made a deal with this? And I had thought about it for a while, and it's like, well, I can see a few reasons, like try to get more money, maybe the business ran out of power. I found like five or six different ways where this made sense. Maybe this was just a call type of thing, like got summoned to your calling, and then went, why not make all of them the case? Why not not decide at all? So, Endeal was made with the concept that I gave up that gap of time to my DM. My DM, in theory, knows what happened, and I don't. So, that's how Endeal got made. And then from there, I just started looking at mechanics and went, okay, well, I'm going to... The way we have our characters in our group set is that we have to have one stat below 10, which, for those of you that don't play D&D, that means you have one stat below average. And Deal actually has two stats below average. Um, that would be both strength and wisdom. And Deal actually is very strong constitutionally. She has gobs and gobs of hit points, which I thought was a good idea for somebody who literally doesn't know how to do anything. Her first day at being a warlock is basically the first day of the campaign. She is brand new to this and actually has significant power behind her. She's probably one of the strongest members of the party. For a complete opposite approach, that would be Kamino, my most recent character, the one that I will be playing probably uh, about three weeks from now, for the first time. Kamino, like, sure. Oh, um, should mention that uh, when it comes to other bits of the character, I kind of just... When I start thinking and I come up with a backstory, I kind of just think about the character. The first thing that comes to my mind is what I use for the character. So when it came to Endeal, I started picturing, okay, what type of person was Endeal? Well, she has a wife. Uh, her wife is a business partner because she's all about business and... She doesn't have romantic love for her wife. Her wife was somebody she grew up with. There we go. Um, somebody she grew up with, and it was a business partner. This was probably a um, predetermined marriage between her family and her wife's family. So they probably have a relationship set where they both have 
um, sexual activities outside of marriage, they both understand that this is a business partnership and they're best friends. So, yeah, that's the way I started picturing it. It's like, okay, that means Endil's a woman. Uh, race. Well, they're elves. But, hmm, this doesn't quite work right with my character concept mechanically. An elf, while certainly possible, the elf race that would fit the best would be Drow, and Drow doesn't really exist as a character option in this campaign setting. So I decided, well, as a part of her mysterious gap of time, she's changing races. She is now an Asimar, uh, which does actually fit in perfectly with the mechanics, and also might explain why she's a Celestial Warlock. So basically, I took the mechanical concept and expanded on it outside of mechanics. And again, the way I picture character description is that I just picture the first thing that comes to mind. And strangely enough, the first thing that came to my mind was a picture of Erika Ishii uh, from the from the Twitch, uh, from Geek and Sundry, or several other streaming things. So a lot of her picture in my head partially came from Erica, which is a little weird, but that's fine. Um, Kamino is a different character entirely. Kamino was created as concept first and not mechanics first. So what I mean by concept first is that I picture a concept in my head and then try to cram the role-playing system mechanics into it. This method is a lot harder to do in D&D than it is in other role-playing systems. Um, this is the way I handle role-playing systems that are a lot more open-ended. Um, so, for an example, other characters that I've done like this in D&D end up with like three or four different classes, because the concept I have has a mixture of a bunch of different features that don't all exist in one class. Fifth edition is a little bit easier when it comes to this. Um, so, the concept behind Camino, uh, Camino Lakeshore is his name, he is a kitty. He was... the design of the character is that he was going to be somebody that everybody wants to hug. Like, big, big creature gives really good hugs, even if he's not very strong. He's just... he's a hugger. He's the type of person that you sit there and talk to and explain things out. He's the type of person who might, in fact, be a diplomancer again. Again, I seem to play a lot of diplomancers. Um, but more importantly, he is your friend. And that's where a lot of the concept behind Camino came from, or Cam, as he's currently being known as, is that he is trying to be everybody's friend. But what would be an interesting situation to have somebody like that in? And it came to me pretty fast. Um, what would be a really interesting situation is if he was everybody's friend and was working for an organization that you really didn't consider your friend. Camino works for effectively this world's equivalent of the Mafia. He's involved with organized crime. So, okay, that's an interesting take on the everybody's friend. Is he being sincere about it? So, sit, think about that for a while. And while I'm thinking about whether he's being sincere or not, I start coming up with mechanics that kind of back up the character concept. Uh, the first thing I came up with, well, he's in a gang, so character and D and D alignment wise, he's probably going to be chaotic or at the very least neutral. He wants to be everybody's friend. If he's being honest about this, he's probably good. If he's not being honest about this, he's probably neutral. So he's either going he's going to be somewhere between neutral good, chaotic good, or chaotic neutral. Two neutral didn't quite fit in in this case. And to be fair, those are the three alignments I tend to make characters the most in, so that's hardly surprising for me. Then I started thinking about things further. Well, why do people want to be his friend rather than the other way around? Is it that he's threatening them? No, I didn't want him to be threatening. Um, I mean, I was just playing Endeal, who actually does have a reasonably high amount of intimidation factor. Uh, I didn't want to make another character like that. So I decided he was just going to be friendly. What else can he do? Why would other people want him to be their friend? And the answer is, he makes everybody else do things better. 
that was part of my concept of I want somebody who everybody wants to be their friend because everybody gets something from it, including Camino. So uh, that's a, the point where I started looking through mechanics in the book, in the books. Um, my first thought was Bard for this. Bards are stereotypical, I'm going to buff the party and so on. And that would kind of make sense, except that only made sense in combat. Bards, while they do have some ability to help people out outside of combat, they're not really that great at it in 5th edition. Okay, uh, the other stereotypical class to do something like this would be a wizard. And I did think about wizard quite a bit. Wizard would still fit his character fairly well. Um, and again, I did the same type of thing when it came to coming up with a physical description of close my eyes and what's the first thing I think of. Uh, in this case, the first thing that came to my mind was this orange cat immediately over to my right because he literally jumped in my face when I was doing that. Right, trash can. Um, trash day tomorrow. So, um, that's where I came off with, okay, I'm going to make a tabaxi. Tabaxi in D&D &D and Pathfinder sense are giant cats. Um, for those of you familiar with the Elder Scrolls, yeah, Khajiit. Tabaxi are basically Khajiit with the serial numbers filed off. Um, in this case, I'm going to make him a lot more feline, house cat-like. So, okay. Okay, I've got that much. Now let's continue going back to the mechanics. Uh, what class makes the most sense? You know what? Forget about what class makes the most sense. What class would be the most interesting? And I started, I used a listing of the archetypes because again, we, my group usually, typically starts at level four. So we have the ability to start as an archetype. And I was looking at the archetypes and looking at the ones that I had not seen anybody play before and came across one called the Mastermind. Now, by the name of this, this sounds like I am making Nate Ford from Leverage. It's the concept when the name comes to my mind is somebody who controls and kind of is the head of everything and gives people like leadership type abilities. That's not the way the Mastermind in 5th edition D&D works. The way the class actually reads to me is somebody who helps out. So their main shtick, a lot of the rogue archetype shticks is that they get something extra to do during combat. The thief, for an example, has the ability to steal from you during combat as a bonus action. Um, acrobats, I believe, have the ability to like dodge and weave out of the way easily. Um, assassins have the ability to just immediately sneak attack you and try to take you out during combat. Masterminds have the ability to use the help action as a bonus action in combat, so they have the ability to aid another person, um, aid another being the older terminology for this, which allows somebody to have advantage on their role, whether that's an attack role, a skill check, or what have you. Which, in combat, that means my character, everyone can use as a friend. Um, there's a couple of exceptions for character concepts that can't, but Basically, I'm awesome teamed up with anybody. So that fit perfectly. And then out of combat, I could extend that further and go, that's what my character does. My character knows a little bit of everything. The whole jack of all trades, master of none shtick. My character does that to a team. So that's when I started looking at the mechanics behind, okay, if I take a mastermind rogue, what else can I do? And that's when I started looking at, okay, let's take a look at the races. I had my heart set on Tabaxi, but I might be willing to go with somebody else. I can always just make them like a big guy that just gives really big hugs. Think like Hagrid. Um, and turns out what I wanted to do, which was make sure that my character had proficiencies in as many skills as possible. I, I play skill monkeys, what can I say? Tabaxi are actually one of the two races that do that the best, or one of the three, really. Humans are not too bad at it either. Uh, that'd be human, half-elf, and tabaxi. So, hey, look, my kitty concept still works. Awesome. Um, mechanically, I could always change the mechanics. I'm less concerned about that, but I wasn't completely tied to making a cat. Anyway, um, 
So, okay. Let's do that. Let's find a background. So in 5th edition D&D, every character has a background. And you can either choose from a list that's in the player's handbook or any other guide, or you can make up your own uh, using very simple guidelines and they give you two separate skills. So I started looking into backgrounds and found one that fit fairly well. It was that of a thief or a member of a thief's guild, in which I went back to my original concept of I am the member of a mafia. This actually fits fairly well. I tweaked the background a little bit uh, but now I have even more skills that are more thief-like. I've got these skills from Tabaxi, which are also thief-like. I have proficiency with using certain types of tools. I... okay, this is fine. And then there's a feat that's called Skilled, which gives you three extra skills. Uh, then there's also Mastermind, which gives you more skills. And end result, I actually have more skills than I don't. So... There are typically, I want to say it's 19, don't quote me on that, 19 separate skills in 5th edition D&D, and my character has 11 of them. Plus the various different types of tool use, I have the most common ones, and my character also knows 5 or 6 languages. So I know a lot about a huge number of things. Awesome! Now let's get the actual stat rolls down. So... My group does not roll for stats for D&D. &D. It used to be that the standard was roll four six-sided dice six times and then range as you see fit. My character, uh, my group doesn't like the randomness, so we instead take a certain number of total stat points and divide that out. As a result, I ran out of stat points really fast because my character needs to be pretty decent at a lot of things. And in 5th edition D&D, you need to have certain stats to be able to do that. Um, wisdom, intelligence, charisma, and dexterity. Those are the four stats that pretty close to all skills are based off of. So that only gave me two stats to not have good, which was strength and con. Uh, my character took both of those as dump stats, so my character has six strength and eight con. I am weak as anything, and I can get one-shotted by a stiff breeze, but hopefully my character won't be involved too much in direct combat. I'm a ranged attacker anyway. Um, okay, so I've got four stats that I need to have decently high. Uh, and I ended up where I had high dex charisma and reasonable intelligence and wisdom. The idea being that my character was book smart may not necessarily be the and knows how to do things but other people may be better at doing the things that he can describe which fit the background of I want to be somebody who everybody wants to go to for help I didn't want to be the person to do everything myself if I was super totally awesome at everything why would anybody come to me. I would just do it myself. and that, that defeats the whole purpose. I still want to be that big furry kitty that everybody just wants to hug. And I'm the best person ever. By the way, from here on, I'm going to be spoiling a bit from my character. Those of you that are in the same campaign that I am, um, that Seth's putting on, just stop here. Just stop. I'm, this is going to be the end of the video. So, okay. Are the viewers gone yet? Okay. So, there's more to this character. And this is the reason why I emphasize the whole concept first. This character is actually an NPC of mine. Um, kind of in disguise, it's a take on an NPC of mine. Uh, the NPC is known as CL, or CL Cahoon, Bard Extraordinaire! And oh boy is he extra. Um, CL is, in various campaign settings, a deity, um, or an aspect of a deity, or just a powerful being that is the controller of a mythical location, I guess you would say, known as the Theator. 
The Theator, which was totally made up by me while I was dealing with theater stuff back in college, um, is a area of sheer and craziness. Um, all things go, and typically theater adventures involve some type of script being torn up. CL is a great actor and a horrible director. CL lives for entertainment, basically. And that's his whole concept. He's a genuine, genuinely nice person, but his goal is to entertain people. His goal isn't to save the world or anything like that. And Camino Lakeshore is CL. So this is a take on CL that I decided on. And I've actually played as CL in a D&D &D campaign before as a bard. But bards in 5th edition D&D aren't what I was picturing. I am picturing a bard like Shakespeare. I am not picturing a bard like bards. <laughs> for lack of a better way of phrasing it. Um, so this version of CL, the concept that I have, is that he had a really strange life. So he grew up kind of like a slave. Um, the original CL that I created was a slave growing up. Um, this one was probably considered to be a slave been back when he was taken over by his family. Um, his family were elves. Um, Cam was obtained for a um, elven general's daughter. Not the head general of the armies or anything like that, but somebody pretty high up. And his daughter, he wanted to make sure that they had a companion. And in the backstory that I'd come up with, Tabaxi were originally meant to be, were originally um, scientifically engineered to be, or genetically engineered to be companions. They are effectively mutated house cats, which is part of the reason why I thought the concept was cool. And the background of this campaign setting is that they used to have technology, and some cataclysm happened a few hundred years ago. So within people's memories, they know that this happened, but they don't have access to any of it. They can't repair it. They can't make bullets. They're in a crappy world that has next to no resources, so they're basically surviving. Um, Cam was one of those creatures that was meant to be more as a companion and comfort aid, which kind of explains his personality a bit. He's the type of person that everybody wants to be friends with. This is exactly the type of person that should be in that role. Only he was that way since being born. He was raised with the General's daughter. The General's daughter is his best friend. And the General's daughter insisted that Cam be taught everything she was. This is how Cam learned all sorts of things. This is why Cam has um, arcana. This is why Cam has history. This is why Cam knows how to write calligraphy and all of these things that you associate with high society that this random street rat basically has. It's because Cam grew up with a general's daughter. And as the general's daughter got older and started recognizing that maybe Cam wasn't doing this fully willingly, she made sure that Cam was involved in every way. Effectively, the plan was basically that uh, Cam would go off with the general's daughter to mages school or wherever, whatever type of college that the daughter was going to be going to, Cam would be going with not just as a servant, or not as a servant at all, but as an equal. Um, and I haven't actually made up the daughter's name yet. I am still go back and forth. I'm thinking Elia. I'm not very good at making up elven names. But what ended up happening was that there was an incident that happened on the island that they were on, and the Empire lost control over the island. They lost control to their Mafia equivalent that Cam's a member of now. Um, as they were evacuating, Cam fell overboard from the ship. And since Cam has low strength, and he, er, has extremely low strength and low constitution, he basically started drowning. Uh, the general had to continue leaving. It was important. Whether it was intentional or not to leave Cam behind, he doesn't know. Uh, the daughter definitely wouldn't have thought it would have been intentional, and that was 12 years ago. 
So all of those concepts occurred in my brain of, I want to make another CL, but I don't want to make the same CL. I want to, my own creative twist on this. So yeah, concept first, character for, or um, framework first, I guess you would say. Those are the two different ways that I make characters. And I actually prefer the latter way but it doesn't make for very good characters in D&D, usually. Um, so Cam's probably not going to stay a rogue the entire time. He's, he's a fourth-level rogue mastermind right now. Chances are he probably won't take another level in it. I don't know what he's going to level up in, but... Not rogue. He doesn't like the fact that he's a part of a criminal organization. He's far from naive. He knows what's going on, but this was his only chance at getting food. This was only his only chance at surviving, basically. They did find him and brought him from the brink of death back up. He does owe them a bit, but he doesn't like what he's doing. He wants to go find the General's daughter again. He wants to go back to where he was, and the General's daughter is older now. I mean, it's been 12 years. It may be an elf, but elves in 5th ed age at the same rate, or grow up at the same rate as humans. They just kind of slow down aging once they reach adulthood. So she's still a young adult, but she's an adult. I, Cam doesn't know what happened to her. He'd like to find her. He'd like to make people smile. He'd like to make people happy. This is the part where you can start seeing the tie into the original concept of CL. He still has the same overall objective of he wants to make the world a happier place. He doesn't, however, know how to do that. Well, I've been rambling on for a little while, though, dear, this was close to half an hour, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Yep. So, there you go. Hope this has been entertaining or informative in some way, and I'll talk to you next time, Internet. Bye. Oh, and Zone Kitty's there. Yes, Zone. Yes.